last left the Gneisenau coming into the port of Brest with their sister ship the Scharnhorst on the 22nd of March 1941. In this part, we will discuss the background to Operation Cerberus, otherwise known as the Channel Dash, and the Gneisenau's eventual fate. Anyway, getting into things here, on the 28th of March, the Royal Air Force would do reconnaissance over the port of Brest and discover the pair of German battleships that had just wreaked havoc in the Atlantic Ocean. After finding this out, steps were immediately taken to carry out bombing raids against the battleships before more anti-aircraft emplacements were positioned to defend the port. Between the 30th and 31st of March, the Royal Air Force would send 109 aircraft to Brest, 101 of which successfully made an attack, dropping 132 tons of bombs on the port with little effect on the two German capital ships, although a number of the ship's crew were killed within their accommodations ashore. On the first attack, the RAF pilots had encountered 40 light anti-aircraft guns along the waterfront, as well as some more flak positions on the promontories to the north, south, and west of Brest. The Germans would beef up their defenses considerably, and by the 24th of August, they would have a total of 333 anti-aircraft guns, made up of 100 heavy, 84 medium, and 149 light guns. Both German capital ships would show quite a bit of wear and tear from Operation Berlin, with the Gneisenau requiring minor repairs to make her ready to go to sea again, while the Scharnhorst would need more due to defects in her boilers. The work being carried out by German dockyard workers as the French were banned from the vessels due to fear of French resistance agents within the port and the Germans would take great steps to ensure the safety of their ships against any saboteurs. On the 5th of April, Gneisenau would be taken out of dry dock and moored in the roadstead near La Mole. The following day, the port would be attacked again, but this time by torpedo bombers, with four Beaufort torpedo bombers, with one determined pilot, Kenneth Campbell, who was killed in the attack, launching a torpedo and successfully hitting the Gneisenau near the rear, which would wreck the starboard propeller and its shaft. The ship began taking on water and started listing heavily, but a salvage ship quickly came alongside and began pumping water. The following day, she would return to dry dock for repairs. Upon entering the dry dock and being further inspected, it was determined that the Gneisenau would be out of action for at least six months. The following nights would see continued RAF attacks against the German ships, and on the 10th, Gneisenau would be hit again, with three bombs striking the ship, killing more than 50 crew and setting fires aboard the vessels, with one of the magazines having to be flooded to prevent fire spreading to it. While this was going on, the Bismarck would be preparing to conduct Operation Rhinobung. Originally, the two battleships in Brest would have participated in a combined sortie into the Atlantic, but the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau needing three and six months respectively in dry dock, it was decided that the Bismarck would go to sea with only the heavy cruiser Prince Eugen. Before the final action of Bismarck, the Prince Eugen would slip away and end up in Brest on June 1st, being quickly docked alongside one of the quays that lined the sheltered harbor. The following month, the RAF would strike again, sending a daylight raid against the German ships in Brest, with an armor-piercing bomb penetrating the Prince Eugen and exploding in the command section of the ship, killing more than 40 of her crew. The damage was severe enough that it would be out of action for a time, but there'd be good news for the Germans. Three weeks later, on the 23rd of July, the Scharnhorst would be out of dry dock and made ready for sea to do exercises, and then go to the smaller French harbor of La Police, hoping that maybe the ship would be safer there, but to prevent the German ship from entering the Atlantic, the RAF would mount a large strike after detecting the movement of the vessel. Being hit by multiple bombs, she would have to go back to Brest to be repaired once more. The German ships would be bombed day after day in the port, but like I mentioned at the beginning, the Germans would not be idle in their defenses of the ships, employing fighter cover, bringing in more anti-aircraft guns, and even using fog generators to make accurate bombing difficult. But even if the bombs hit the outskirts of the shipyard, it could have consequences like killing the crew of the ships or dockyard workers, so the workers would be shipped in for work and out to the outskirts of Brest for the night. Now with the ships not being in any state to go to sea, some of the crew were taken back to Germany, and new recruits would use the vessels for training whilst the repairs were being made. Hitler would see Norway as a critical theater of the war, fearing that there might be an allied invasion of the occupied nation, and therefore he wanted his battle fleet to be based out of Norwegian ports to counter this possible threat. Also thinking that the task of convoy raiding in the Atlantic was much better suited to the U-boats. So in a meeting with Commander-in-Chief of the Kriegsmarine, Admiral Erich Rede, he would state as soon as practicable, the German surface fleet in Brest was to return to Germany, and with autumn soon coming, the three ships in Brest would be near the completion of their repairs. The question now became, once the ships were ready for service, how would they return to Germany? Well, there would be two possible options. The first route would take the ships northwards towards Iceland, and then east and south around the British Isles, while the second route being the more direct one, through the English Channel and into German ports found in the North Sea. 
Each would have their pros and cons, but both were fraught with danger. The first route would take the ships close to Scapa Flow, the home port of the home fleet, and once the German ships departed, it would be possible for the British to assemble a powerful force and destroy them. The second route would bring the ships within 20 miles of the English coast, with its guns and airfields, essentially having to run the gauntlet of a large number of coastal artillery batteries, not to mention the bombers and naval vessels that could strike them. Both routes seemed like they would spell doom for the ships involved. Raider would disagree with the views of Hitler, seeing the German surface fleet, especially the capital ships, believing that they could still be useful as commerce raiders in the Atlantic. In this, he would delay the ship's return to Germany as long as he could, but with the entry of the United States to the war in December of 1941, but with the entry of the United States to the war in December of 1941, it effectively meant the end of Germany sending capital ships into the Atlantic to raid Allied merchantmen, as it was too dangerous with the combined fleets of the Royal Navy and United States Navy. Although the decision to bring the capital ships back to Germany made sense, Raider still struggled with it, as neither route seemed to bring much promise for the ships to return intact. While planners were looking at every possibility, Hitler became tired of the delays and preempted any decision that could be made and decided that the ships would go through the English Channel. Relying on the surprise of the event and overwhelming air cover, there would be no ifs, ands, or buts about this plan, as Hitler told his admirals to get going with the plan. But there would be a meeting on the 22nd of January, where Raider would open up the meeting by stating how pessimistic he was about the operation, and then handed it over to Vice Admiral Siliax, who outlined the plan to Hitler that had been made, apparently doing so with the same sense of pessimism. Now to quote from Run the Gauntlet, The Channel Dash 1942 by Ken Ford, quote, that the ships would leave Brest under the cover of darkness and make the actual passage through the narrowest part of the passage in daylight, allowing for maximum air cover to be available at what would be the most critical part of the voyage. End quote. Hitler would agree to the plan and would promise the air cover would be available, although the Luftwaffe would have doubts as if they would have the necessary aircraft available to comply with this directive, as they had quite the considerable commitment to the Eastern Front. Hitler would insist on the plan going ahead, as he did not believe the British being capable of making quick decisions, especially in transferring their bombers and fighters to the southeastern part of England to attack the ships in the Dover Straits, also believing that if the ships remained in Brest, that they would inevitably be destroyed, but through an operation, there could be some hope that the ships might survive. On the flip side of the coin, the British feared that if the ships remained in Brest, that they posed a threat to the Atlantic shipping. And even with aerial photos showing that the ships were damaged, there was no way of telling how damaged that they really were, and the level of progress of the repairs. If the berths were suddenly empty, who knew where they could have gone? With both the Royal Navy and RAF giving some thought to this, how they could deal with the German threat in Brest, with hope mostly resting on detecting any German movements. Coming to the conclusion, the Germans might realize that remaining in Brest meant the destruction of those ships, and might risk the English Channel, believing that the Germans would choose to go through the Dover Straits at night, meaning that a majority of their voyage could be detected by vigilant air patrols, with steps being taken throughout 1941 and 1942 to detect enemy fleets in the channel in case they chose to take this route. Getting back to the Nisenau and the other ships, by December the ships appeared to be seaworthy, despite continuous attacks by the RAF. Naval Group West, based out of Paris and Brest, would work in secrecy to work out the details of the upcoming channel dash. The first problem being that fighter cover had to be assembled and be ready along the route to provide a continuous air umbrella. Another problem would be the need to clear a safe path for the ships to be swept through the channel, and finally, the British radar that monitored the channel would have to be jammed so that they would become blind. But these are just the main obstacles. There would be plenty more for this operation, but without the main ones being solved for the operation, it would most likely fail. The responsibility for the air cover would be given to Colonel Adolf Galland, one of the Luftwaffe's most famous aces, being given approval by the Führer to assemble the necessary aircraft for the operation, not being an enviable task to assemble the required quantity of aircraft, as he met resistance from senior Luftwaffe officers, not to mention as relations between the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine were becoming somewhat strained, when the Luftwaffe was to provide air cover for what was strictly a naval operation. Galland was given three fighter groups and 30 night fighters for the operation, which amounted to some 280 aircraft for the operation. These aircraft were to be stationed along the channel to provide the continuous umbrella of air cover, with the night fighters providing the cover during the pre-dawn hours of the operation when the battle fleet rounded the Channel Islands and moved into the actual English Channel, where the day fighters would then take over, being organized so that 16 aircraft would be flying close air patrols over the ships at any one time. 
With Gallen being headquartered at Le Touquet to coordinate the plans and Colonel Maxi Bell being aboard the Scharnhorst to be the main seaborne command center with operational fighter controllers being placed on the other two main warships. Next, Commodore Friedrich Rüge was in command of all German minesweeping activities in the English Channel. Rüge would clear a lane for the German warships through the English Channel, with only Ruga and two of his planners actually understanding the purpose of their mission, with work continuing up until the time of the breakout, even with bad winter weather conditions. The third main problem was tackled by head of the Luftwaffe signal service, Wolfgang Martini. Martini's experts had identified the wavelengths of the British equipment and had constructed some transmitting bases along the northern French coast capable of jamming the British radar. Martini's plan would involve starting weeks in advance before the breakout. With the start of each day, his teams would transmit signals set to the same frequencies as the British to mask the reflections of the radar beams to simulate interference, gradually lengthening the times of their transmissions day by day until long periods of jamming would occur without raising British alarm. Vice Admiral Siliax, not knowing what his battle fleet would be up against, would start to allocate ships to protect his heavy units, taking the 5th Destroyer Flotilla and making it join the heavy units at Brest, of which it consisted of the destroyers Rickard Betson, Paul Jacobi, Friedrich Inn, Hermann Schumann, Z-25, and Z-29, while another destroyer would be sunk while transiting the channel to go to Brest. Along with this, three flotillas of fast e-boats were given to Ciliacs for the operation, joining the battle fleet in groups as they would be stationed along the coast of northern France. During the pass through the Straits of Dover, the German ships would come under intense fire from British coastal batteries. With that in mind, German batteries in the Pas de Calais would provide a counter-battery to hopefully make the British gunners keep their heads down. Like I mentioned previously, the British were continuing to develop plans to counter the Channel Dash, with air patrols and submarine monitoring off the coast of Brest, along with many other parts in place for the eventual dash. Now that we have set up the events for the Channel Dash, I have to be honest, I did not think that it would take an entire video to set up the Channel Dash, and I thought I would be able to cover the setup and operation service all in one go. But there was so much detail here that I wanted to do it right. So next time, we will begin to cover the events of the Channel Dash. If you've enjoyed this video and the series, please remember to like and subscribe as it will help the channel to grow. But I do wish you all good luck this week. Until next time, my friends.